Pixel Therapy is a member of the But Why Though Podcast Network. Go to butwhythopodcast.com for an inclusive geek community offering pop culture news, reviews, and podcasts. For me, making games is about, is like another way of letting people sit at my dinner table. There's sort of this element of being able to share what your experiences are with someone else. And in in a video game, it's like this empathetic glimpse right into someone's life and into the people that are making it like and it shares that with theater like greg said it is laborious to the players but also sorry it is laborious to the players but i was saying players as in the actors like the players in a show but also the players as in the players who are audiences look at that uh intersection Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, where what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. Every other week, we bring on a guest who may or may not consider themselves a gamer to discuss the games that have made them and changed them, and all the feelings they have about our favorite pastime. I'm your co-host, Jamie, pronoun she, her. And I'm your co-host, Spencer, pronouns they, them. And this is Pixel Therapy. We've got one whole new and noteworthy tidbit it's a big uh, for, one for y'all today it is a big one it's actually pretty exciting uh your co-hosts spencer and i uh have been invited to guest on the cozy robot show which is hosted by science communicator best-selling author and science advisor to the marvel multiverse mike mccarg i just uh, want to say the job title science advisor <laughs> to the marvel multiverse is like i feel like you can just stop like like you've achieved <laughs> it you've done yeah, it you've yeah. won life you've ascended the Full mountain stop. you've ascended the mountain <laughs> but uh yeah, but you know what mike is mike is at the top of the mountain he's reaching his hand back down to down us, to, uh, lifting slowly. us up like frodo <laughs> pulling us up the mountain he's well, the samwise <laughs> where the frodo yes i was going to say sam's the one sam was the one really doing the work there um uh, but yeah, so so the Cozy Robot folks, uh, they invite us to come be on the show. Uh, at the time that you're listening to this episode on Tuesday, we will actually have already in the past uh, been on the show Monday night. Multiverse. Uh, so our, our episode with Mike and the Cozy Robots, it's already aired. You can get that on their website, CozyRobots.com, or you can go to YouTube or pretty much any podcast platform. Just search for the Cozy Robot Show, and you can watch or listen to us over there uh, having what I have to assume is going to be a fantastically interesting and in-depth conversation about safe spaces. We're manifesting. And we're manifesting, yes. Um, perhaps you can hear my imposter syndrome oozing it's through the bleeding right through. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you know, worst case scenario, you can just watch that on display um, <laughs> by checking out the Cozy Robot Show. Uh, it's going to be Mike, great. Mike McCart. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, it is time to get cozy. Pull up an armchair. Feel free to lie down on your couch and let's talk about our feelings. Spencer, we've got kind of a unique format for folks today. Um, you see, we've got a meaty mm -hmm. double interview of an episode for you all. Uh, oh, yeah. Our guests, plural, <laughs> Get some of that sibilance in there. Uh, for this interview, uh, our guests are Gregory Kung Strausser and Sarah Eskandari. Greg is the producing director at 4615 Theater Company based in the Washington, D.C. area. And Sarah is an AR VR developer and freelance artist currently working in academia. Is it academia Fancy. or academia? My hero, academia. I don't know. <laughs> That's how I figure out how to pronounce it. Is it so working in academia? Academia. At the university. Sarah, let us know. Conversations we should have had before hitting record. Uh, uh, but yeah, so, so Sarah is currently working at the University of Michigan, um, but with uh, they have prior experience in indie game development, helping make games like We Are the Caretakers and Chess Heroes. Uh, and at this point, you're probably wondering, why are y'all interviewing these two seemingly unrelated individuals? Well... <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> Greg and Sarah, along with some other folks at 4615 Theater Company, uh, they came together and they made this video game. Uh, specifically, it's a four episode visual novel series called Dark City uh, that you can get at 4615theaterco.itch.io. You can catch that link in our episode description. Uh, but the first episode is free 
And uh, this game, you know, just preemptively, I'll say it, it's it'll run on pretty much anything, PC or Mac, Windows or iOS. Um, but Greg is the director and writer of the game. Sarah's the artist and designer. Uh, they made and released Dark City as part of 4615's virtual theater programming this season, uh, because in case you guys haven't heard, uh, there's a pandemic. And uh, that has really made in-person theater challenging. Uh, Slash impossible. The the thing about theater is that you take a lot of strangers and you put them in a room together and they sit very close in the dark. Like so close. Like so close to each other and breathe right in each other's faces. And you really can't do that in the middle of a pandemic. So uh, in-person theater has been basically impossible for the last year. And uh, 4615 Theater uh, was looking for ways to pivot. And they decided to- They were like, hold my beer. (laughs) Hold my beer. Uh, We're going to make a video game. (laughs) Um. You know, we have this great conversation with Greg and Sarah in the interview all about like why they went with a video game. Uh, I don't want to give the whole interview away, uh, but because we record our interviews in advance, uh, we actually had them on the show like the the week before the game released. Um, So now all four episodes are out and Spencer and I have had a chance to check it out a bit. So before we get it, got into the interview, uh, I want to just ask you, Spencer, what do you think of Dark City? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually just finished playing episode one um, and it was absolutely riveting. I really have to say, um, Greg, you did an amazing job writing. Yes. <laughs> Sarah, you did an amazing job with the art. The art um, is beautiful. Just gorgeous. Uh, and there's a, also just a really evocative and immersive and, and beautiful score by Jordan Friend. Uh, Jordan, we didn't have a chance to meet, but hey, Jordan, if you're listening to this, amazing score. <laughs> Great score. Um, yeah, so let me just, um, I know we'll get into it again later, but I'll just read a quick just a quick synopsis of the game just to set the stage for folks. Yeah, yeah. But Dark City, um, it's a visual novel, uh, as Jamie said, from 4615 Theater Company. And let me just set the stage. Before his big sister died, Judah had it all. An education, job prospects, and a gorgeous apartment in Aeolus City's hippest district. But in a matter of a year, everything was taken from him. Haunted by his sister's murder and frustrated by the city's tepid response, he leaves altogether, trying to move on. But when an an investigative journalist from an indigenous tribe shows up on his doorstep looking into his sister's role at her former employer, new revelations emerge. So this game, it's basically like a solar punk version of, um, what's it called? Objection. Oh, Phoenix Wright. Yeah, Phoenix Wright, Ace yeah. Attorney. Um, it's it's like this kind of retro style, like choose your own adventure, um, gorgeous art, gorgeous soundtrack. And it's, um, I, I think, unique, especially for... A, f- a first, like a debut game. Um, mm-hmm. They have a full cast of voice actors who yep. are bringing these characters like very fully to life. So it's it's a very visually and narratively rich world. Um, I, I, I'm really blown away by the level of world building here. I don't know, Jamie, if you if you had anything you wanted to add to that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's that's spot on. I uh, <clears throat> full disclosure, I played all four episodes in like basically She's one an sitting. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did it in basically one sitting, which I think is a testament mm. to the way the game uh, draws you through the episodes. The story, uh, you know, this being uh, primarily a visual novel, the story is the most important part. And I think it really holds up. I think this was um, the, the line by line dialogue is really, really good. The characters feel really fully fleshed out and like the lore and world building of the, the setting of the game is super interesting. I think, uh, you know, they brought in a lot of, a lot of things that we're really wrestling with, um, mm. th- things that are really coming into the, the cultural consciousness right now mm-hmm. around, um, colonizers and uh the rights of indigenous folks Mm -hmm. to the land um and to resources and displacement yeah displacement how how colorism and white supremacy and to be clear there aren't um you know this is a fictional setting so they have uh fictional cultures and races in the game but it all really ties back to our very real world you know they're telling stories about how even characters who exist within the same race can experience colorism and how that impacts their experience of their race um Mm. how class uh intersects with the experience of race and access to resources there's a lot of a lot of great 
themes running through the game that I think are really timely. Um, the narrative really <clears throat> uh, mirrors a lot of what we're seeing, or not a lot of, but like the the world that it's set in um, has a lot of direct um, ties in relation to what we're seeing happening in in Palestine to the Palestinian mm-hmm. people. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was it felt like a really relevant and timely piece, and I thought that was really. Uh, really cool to see. I think a lot of times, especially because game development can take so long, sometimes things can feel like they're a little bit behind the moment Mm. that we're in, not in a bad way, but just because something takes longer. So it it can feel more like a reflection on something that's already happened. And this game felt incredibly like it was talking about something that, that we're seeing happen in our world right now. And I don't know how much of that was actually planned or was just kind of like weird coincidence. Mm. Um, but it it yeah it made it all feel really um, immediate, absolutely, and, and necessary and, and urgent. And uh, yeah, I mean, just just props to Greg and Sarah. Y'all did excellent, excellent work yeah. uh, on this game. And as like kind of a first outing, and and this whole question of like, can games be theater? That we're going to dive into more in the interview. Mm-hmm. It's it's all really interesting stuff. Yeah, I think too something something else I appreciated was. Um, stuff like gender and sexuality are yeah. sort of just seamlessly folded into the narrative. Um, like this is a cast of characters um, that I think a lot of players who have one or more marginalized identities, it may, it, it's very refreshing to kind of see this world filled with people like us um, in a way that doesn't feel like, like so many other games I'm like waiting to encounter the one character who is representing me in the game. Like I'm searching, I'm, I have my eyes peeled open throughout the whole game, waiting to encounter the one NPC who is hinted <laughs> at being trans or seeing, you know, the one storyline that has a gay or lesbian character. But I'm always like looking for one <laughs> one thread it's never like oh they're queer and they're also asian and they're also non-binary and they're also not actively suffering (laughs) 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 um like you know like a lot like it's just it's just really cool to kind of have that be a given and not like an exception or like a gem that i'm searching through the rough to 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 point out and hold up and be like, look what I found. Um, Mm -hmm. Like it's nice to just have that be normalized and not like a special treat that I get as a queer player. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's real. So I just, yeah, really appreciative of, of that. And, and like we were saying, so the, um, the mechanics of the game, it's really interesting. Um, as Judah, you're you're sort of investigating, you know, what's this corporation doing to this city? Um, what's happening um, to certain groups of people? Um, what happened to his sister? Um, you know, what nefarious plot can we take down? Um, so there's a lot of this sort of investigative conversations where as Judah, um, you're uh, navigating, um, you know, various conversational paths and, and certain answers will get you more information. Um, but if you try to accuse someone too soon or uncover a lie without evidence, um, you could actually turn the conversational partner against you and, um, not get to the outcome that you need to move forward. Um, I thought, I'll be honest, like I was pleasantly surprised by the level of conversational complexity in the game. Like, mm-hmm. like the writing is, is utterly fantastic and, and really advanced. Um, like I, I was, I'm really engaged and engrossed and I, and I'm like, after this, I'm probably going to go play the second episode because I, I just can't wait. Um, so I was really just impressed and, and blown away by that. Um, and also it took me a couple tries to, to move forward without, um, like you really had to pay attention to what you were saying and the details you were looking for. I'm not trying to spoil anything, so I'm talking kind of high level. Um, <laughs> but it's a really thoughtful game, and um, I, I was I'm just really I'm, I'm just utterly impressed. <laughs> yeah, same. And you know, I'll say this: like, even if uh, I mean, I think if you're listening to this show, the, a lot of these themes we're discussing probably resonate with you. But even uh, in addition to the themes the the core narrative is super compelling uh as i said i think already the the characters are really uh deep they feel fully fleshed out 
And it is ultimately at its heart, this, you know, this detective mystery Mm -hmm. um, with some thriller elements. So it does, you know, it feels very fast paced. It hooks you in like you want to know what happened to Judah's sister and why. And in, an you know, unraveling that um, feels very engaging. So yeah, like I said, the the writing is is just great, and all the character designs are so awesome. I love how um, how detailed they are. Um, all the different facial animations for when they're kind of experiencing different emotions. I think one of my favorites that I clocked was when Judah is like surprised and his yeah. eyes look at wide. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I thought that was great. On the topic of the attention to detail, too, I I really appreciated. Um, like interspersed with the scenes where you're actually talking, there are these scenes where um, you're just in a room or in a setting and you're clicking around on on various objects in the background to learn more information or find clues and things like that, mm-hmm. um, which I wasn't expecting that sort of secondary layer of really immersing into the world and, and paying attention to all the little details in the background. And um, that was really cool too. Yeah, yeah. One more thing that I I just really loved about this game that I, I I'm sure I've already touched on a bit and we'll we'll again in the interview, but it's just the <laughs> fact that this team was comprised of um, BIPOC artists and theater makers. Yeah. And something that I really appreciated is that like as an Asian person, um, there are so many games that have Asian characters, but they're like a total like amalgamation of the Asian diaspora that is flattened into this one usually like light skinned idea of what an Asian person is. And it doesn't really speak to any one Asian culture. And something I loved about this game is that you can really see reflected um, like in the cast and in, and in the characters in the art um, threads from from various uh, cultures throughout the Asian diaspora in a way that feels really authentic and relatable. Like I could see people that looked like Filipino-ish, like me. And th- like, it's not just that Asian means Chinese or Korean. Like Asian means a lot of different things and a lot of different skin colors and presentations and voices. And I just, I, it's so rare to see that. And so I, I just really, really appreciated um, the ways that all those cultures sort of came through. Um, it was, it was really cool. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so all, all in all, Spencer and I give this our seal of approval. <laughs> Folks should go check out this awesome game um, from 4615 Theater Company and in particular our, our pals, Greg and Sarah. Um, again, you can get that by, you can get the game by going to 4615 Theater Company's website or going to 4615theaterco.itch.io and theater is spelled, uh, the theatrical way, (laughs) T-H-E-A-T-R-E. So 4615theatrco.itch.io. Uh, you can get all four episodes. The first one is free. Uh, the other three, uh, you can get in a bundle for, I want to say it's like $9, $8, something like that. Um, yeah. Very affordable. Definitely go check them out. Um, and without further ado, here is our interview with the awesome creators of this game, Greg and Sarah. Hello to our wonderful guests, and thank you so much for joining us in the Virtual Pixel Therapy Studio. Um, to start, could, would you all mind sharing, we have two wonderful guests today, would you mind sharing your names, your pronouns, and just a little bit about how you spend your time? Sarah, you 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 first. <laughs> oh, oh, God damn it, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Greg. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, I'm Sarah Eskandari or Dari. Um, my pronouns are a she, her, and they, them. Uh, and I spend a lot of time working, uh, hanging out with my cat and playing Genshin Impact right now. Yeah. Yas. <laughs> Hello, my name is Gregory Kungstrasser. I use he and his pronouns. Um, I'm a director, writer, and arts leader in DC. Uh, how do I spend my time right now? Uh, I spend my time... 
Uh, working a lot, I lead a, a theater organization uh, called 4615 Theater Company. Um, and I also spend a lot of time playing Breath of the Wild. Yes. Uh, and I guess like now I can say like I spend a lot of time like working out because I've been trapped in my apartment mm. during this whole quarantine. And it's just become like my therapy and my way to like concentrate on mm. myself. Yeah, it's, there's something I, I feel like it can get easy for me to sort of lose touch with my body and just being present in my physical form because so much of my day to day is spent on a screen. Um, and I think the passing of time can just feel so flattened and um, like every day is, can feel the same. I think that's starting to shift now that we're getting vaccinated and things are starting to, oh, like, I mean, I'm saying open up as if I'm participating in that, but I'm, I'm not yet. I'm, I hope to one day, <laughs> but like uh, it just, I, I love that, that I, I, I have a, like, I can imagine that, that physicality and, and, and kind of connecting with your body in that way must feel really nice. And I'm totally, I'm you named you. it exactly as it was like, actually like literally being in connection with who my body is like learning to love myself and be like, Oh my God, I'm like so sexy. Like what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> like it's just, it's been, it's been wonderful. And I think that there's only one takeaway from this pandemic. It's that like, you know, being trapped in a room with yourself, like, you know, you either learn to like love yourself or you either learn to like, you know, get over it. So mm. yeah. <laughs> wear the same pa- pair of pants for three days straight and you know, it's fine. No one has yeah. to see them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, right. And you mentioned um, your theater company, 46, is it, how do I pronounce, 4615? We say 4615. 4615 four, six, four, six, numbers. Um, mm-hmm. Thank you. So 4615 Theater Company, I wanted to say, wow, thank you so much for making time for this interview during Tech Week. But I imagine like the definition of Tech Week kind of changes when it, when it's um, virtual and also a game. And for, for the folks at home, um, <laughs> uh, Gregory and, and Sarah, they're working on this really amazing um, game, visual novel called Dark City, um, which is coming out in a few days, right? Yes, April twenty third. I can't believe it. Oh my God, it's crunch, so it's like, yeah, like tell us more about. Um, tell us more. I want to like rewind and talk a little bit about the uh, about four six one five. But um, what is Dark City? Just a, like a quick couple sentences about it. Sure. A quick couple sec- se- sentences about it. Dark City is a visual novel uh, video game. It's told in episodes. There are four episodes. And on the surface, it's about uh, two young people, uh, one young man who is trying to investigate the death of his sister. He's been told his entire life that she committed suicide, but he's always suspected that it was actually homicide. Mm. And it uh, it gets more complicated when he collaborates with another investigative journalist who believes that his sister was also killed and had it has to do with this shadowy organization that his sister used to work for called the AIO. Uh, and both of them go into an investigation to figure out what is exactly happening and operating behind those doors. Mm. Uh, so that's at the surface level of it. But then as it gets deeper, you start to see a story about how complicated the truth can actually be, um, mm. the level of complicity that one has, especially in spaces that are completely different from their own identities and walks of life. Uh, and I also would say it's a it's a story about storytelling, about people who want to tell a story uh, and are trying to figure out the best way to frame and tell that story too. Mm. I love how as both a game and as a piece of, of the- I mean, just by the fact that you are a, th- a theater makers, um, like it's serving me drama. It's also serving me like multiple storylines and yes. this kind of noir like <laughs> energy that I think I would be into whether I was seeing a performance or playing a game. Like I, I'm just like all the vibes are just really excellent. I'm so excited to be talking to y'all about it. Um, mm. But before we get more into Dark City, let's talk about a, a bit about 4615. Um, can you tell us more about the, the theater company? Sure. 4615 was founded actually as a college summer project by its artistic director, Jordan Friend. Um, he's a great, incredible artistic leader, director, and actor, and musician in town. He actually composed the music and designed the sound effects uh, for Dark City. Um, he founded this company uh, you know, several years ago while he was actually still an undergrad. Uh, but then after he graduated, he decided, no, you know, I, I want to take this and I want to professionalize it and let's like actually make it into a thing. And just to paint a picture for y'all, prior to the pandemic coming in, uh, 
4615 was thriving. You know, we mm. had just done a five show season. Uh, we were operating um, like pretty much like uh, not in the deficit, which is really wonderful for a nonprofit theater <laughs> yeah. company. Mm. <laughs> and also, we had just been nominated and then subsequently won the Helen Hayes Award for Outstanding New Emerging Theater Company, which is a uh. really great, you know, kind of level up for us because that means it's access to new donors, access to government legitimacy. You know, people and agencies start to think of us as like, actually a real institution and entity. Um, and then, you know, it attracts a lot more support and media and, you know, it gives us a little bit of a, of a platform to like actually scale up our work. Um, so, you know, our mission as the theater company is to explore the echoes and resonances of storytelling throughout the time. Uh, and for us, that has always been primarily done through the vehicle of theater and theater performance. Mm -hmm. But when the pandemic hit, obviously that was not <laughs> going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and that was so much of the issue and the technicalities that we were facing and trying to program a series of uh, projects that, you know, our audiences could enjoy safely, but that would still be artistically uh, excellent. And I can talk all about this philosophy and this logic <laughs> about how we did it, and I would love to, you know, if there's time to do that. But that's, I think, a, like a nice snapshot of like who we are uh, and where we are right now. Awesome. Beautiful. And Sarah, was there anything you wanted to add? I no, I'm I'm contracted into four six one five. So mm. Greg is definitely the the, um, the expert expert here. Yes, I, thank yes. you. <laughs> really really welcoming to an outsider and i've felt Love amazing that. as a part of the team mm -hmm. <laughs> really great great collaboration <laughs> i'm just a fan i guess <laughs> um i was reading about the 4615 go program and i thought it was really interesting i was wondering if you could take a minute to talk specifically about what that is and why it was created I can take a minute, two minutes, <laughs> like three minutes. <laughs> like, y'all, we can kiki about this because this, I am so proud of how we approach this. If, if I can just take a step back, just to, like, you know, mm -hmm. really talk about the diligence and the amazing, you know, versatility of these artists that I work with. I'm just so proud to be associated with this company. But essentially, when the pandemic started and all the theaters were scrambling to, like, you know, pivot into, like, you know, the Zoom and the virtual theater spheres, I had the opposite reaction. You know, I don't pivot. That's just not what I do, right? Mm -hmm. I invest in myself. I build skills. Mm -hmm. I want to use those skills, all right? I expand. I don't pivot. Mm -hmm. So that was exactly what I said to <laughs> leadership. I told them, you know, like, let's not dive into anything right now. Like, let's focus and learn research before we, you know, program anything. And that was like the best thing that we possibly could have done. So there were two major pieces of learning that really inspired 4615 Go. The first came from an amazing theater director, an arts leader in DC, my mentor, uh, Sima Sueko. She was formerly the deputy artistic director of Arena Stage. Uh, and now she uh, works in consensus organizing and directs theater projects and film projects, you know, across the country. Mm. Um, she said something that just blew my mind and it was on a call with other artistic leaders. And it really made me completely approach this problem that we were facing as arts makers in a new light. But what she said was, you know, right now artists are suffering but they still exist, right? Mm -hmm. They're there. They're suffering, but they still exist. And then she also said, and audiences are suffering too, but they still exist, right? What has actually been broken is the method of delivery between the mm. artist and the audience. And that just blew my mind because I was like, oh my gosh, you know, that is such a great perspective to think about this from. And then it even, you know, it, it went one step further for me because I was thinking, you know, our method of delivery has actually been broken for a really long time. It's gatekeeping. We force people to come to the theater spaces. You know, we charge these exorbitant ticket prices for them to come. You know, like it really is actually a really exclusionary tactic, our method of delivery as it was. And then mm -hmm. I realized, you know, as a theater maker who's traveled the globe and worked in many different countries, that that's not how the rest of the world does it. You know, we don't have, the rest of the world doesn't have this subscription-based model where people come to the theater, right? You know, people were going out into the streets and making performances in site-specific locations. And I was like, my gosh, you know, that is oh something God. that we really need to get back to. So that's the first yes. piece of learning. The second piece of learning was... Um, uh, so my co-director, Paige Washington, who's a, uh, a lead on leadership at 4615, she and I spearheaded this forum called the BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color uh, Emerging Theater Leaders Forum. We had around like 40 people across the country RSVP. Only like 20 people showed up, but that's okay. <laughs> because it was still fine because we still got together and we still got to do the things that we wanted to do, which was number one, activate our mutual brain trust. And then number two, mm -hmm. uh, build coalition and networks. And from that piece, I learned that... 
It's not about redefining theater for this moment, but just looking at the definition of theater already. Like, what is it right now? So these two pieces of learning mm. took him back to leadership. We sat down, all right? We thought about, okay, how do we fix the method of delivery? And then the second thing was, how are we defining theater? And for me, there are three principal tenets that really make theater theater. The first mm. being uh, it's live. The second being that it occurs in a shared space. And then the final component is that it's laborious. And it's not just mm. laborious for the artists who make it, but it's laborious for the audiences too, right? Because they have to willingly suspend their disbelief. And if you take it to the next level, if you're, you know, you're a Brechtian kind of person, uh, he's a he's a uh, theater theorist for those who are not familiar Thank with you. the theater people. Uh, <laughs> uh, you also have to be observant and critically observing all of the different artistic components that make the performance function as one cohesive unit. So it's it's a laborious task. It asks a lot of artists and audiences. And if it has those three tenets, then you know, then it's theater, right? Or at least it possesses the spirit of theatricality. And that is our exact framing. That's the framework that we approached to programming all of, the sh uh, all of the projects that we did in 4615 Go. Our philosophy was that theater is everywhere and all you need to do is go out and find it. And that's why we mm. called it 4615 Go. <gasps> and that's why the slogan <laughs> is theater is everywhere. <laughs> but I just want to finish this <laughs> like long-winded explanation by saying, Give me chills. You know, Thank you. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gives me chills to think about, you know, how long we, it took for us to get here. But mm -hmm. I, I want to conclude, you know, just by saying that what we're doing, I'm not claiming it's theater, okay? I'm not saying that my video game is theater. I'm not saying that the phone call play that we did with Britt Willis is theater, right? What I'm saying is that each of these projects, they possess the spirit of theatricality. And as a theater whose mission is to explore echo echoes and resonances of storytelling throughout the ages, mm. if it has that spirit, we have claim to it. We can mm. use that as a vehicle to explore. So that is what I used to legitimize all of the programming that we did and why I think Jordan and Paige and, and the rest of the 4615 cohort was like, yes, we can we can go ahead and do this. So we're going we're gonna to do it. I that. mean, I'm bought in. Like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's bring it back to Dark City, uh, which is speaking about the, you know, the, the spirit of theatricality and um, we're talking about the method of delivery. Um, Dark City is a visual novel. Um, and so for folks who may not be familiar, uh, what is a visual novel? Wow, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> Sarah, do you want to take this one? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, a visual novel um, is essentially an animated game. Um, so in the way you would pick up a normal physical novel, you're going to novel, you're going to read from, you know, I guess, whatever your language is, left to right, right to left, whatever. Um, it's going to be flat text on a page, nothing crazy. You can put it on your shelf, whatever. Um, a visual novel is typically going to be in a digital format. Um, and that text is going to be segmented and, um, paired with, uh, different visuals, um, <gasps> graphics. So art of characters, um, glorious, uh, alive backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. and that helps, uh, give this, uh, illustrate, um, these environments and these characters for the reader. Um, some popular visual novels. Um, my first thought was Doki Doki Literature Club, but oh my I feel God. Like that's not <laughs> that's not <laughs> what you want to start with. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, um, not if you're prone to any sort of. Not yeah, if you, yeah, yeah I don't even want to spoil people, but yeah, yeah. No, no. the game starts with a trigger warning, so. Yeah. <laughs> follow that. There you go. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe it's a them. great example because because it's a digital medium, because it's going to be typically on a phone or a desktop computer, you can program a lot of interesting interaction with the player. So it sort of combines uh, a classic physical choose your own adventure novel, bringing it into a digital vibrant world uh, that may mess with you a little bit. Mm. And Sarah, you provided all of the art and design for Dark City. Is that right? Yes, they yes. did. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just say, from what I've seen so far, um, the art is absolutely stunning. I was wondering if you could talk a bit Thank about you. your process for bringing this world to life. Um, maybe, like, you know, what were some of your sources of inspiration? What kind mm -hmm. of feelings and themes were you exploring? Would love to just hear from you, kind of paint us that picture. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's, I mean, it's such a big question. Um, 
So for a little bit of background, um, I work as like a software programmer in ARVR as like my day job. NBD. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, mm. um, but I began in indie game development. W- w- listen, I was an art major, but when you have programming experience, any internship you do, they're mm. like, oh, well, you know, they can program. So we're just going to make them do that. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you do art too. We don't care. Um, mm. So, oh. so when Greg was like, Hey, I want your help with this game. And I was like, well, you know, I have programming experience. He's like, I just want your art. That, uh, <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> I just want you to feel seen. <laughs> yeah. I did. <laughs> I felt appreciated. I felt yeah. not, whatever. Um, yeah. So when you are working in art, um, any sort of art for games, you are trying to topple creating a world. You, in the same way that a writer has to break down all of the lore, um, an artist has to visualize that lore. So uh, I guess I think about that like cultural iceberg diagram, all of the iconography in a culture, um, what the rug may, what the rugs may look like, um, what sort of, uh, relics they have, what kind of clothes people wear, what, um, visual languages in the buildings and their architecture, all of that goes in to the visual representation of the world building. And when we were beginning Dark City, um, uh, there were a lot of key influences. Um, we were f- specifically focused on um, pulling inspiration from uh, various um, Chinese and uh, Thai cities. Um, so I think the biggest one overall was sort of Chiang Mai and Bangkok. Um, and it the, the sort of next step after establishing um, what are some of the real life uh, sources of inspiration is just researching the hell out of everything. Um, and you really want to, uh, make sure that you are celebrating those sources of inspiration. But when this was first pitched, uh, the overarching visual style we wanted to commit to, in addition to these, um, real life influences was solar punk. Uh, solar punk is essentially what if we had, actually committed in our world to sustainability and to prioritizing solar energy. Mm. And, um, that's what the world was focused on. So imagine, um, lots of flora and foliage everywhere, um, beautiful waterscapes, uh, and it's futuristic. Uh, so an idealistic view, um, despite whatever criminal underbelly, uh, may exist, um, Mm. of a sort of punk world. Um, these sources, um, which are also inspired by a lot of just the creative team's backgrounds. Um, so we're all of various Asian descents, I believe, except for Jordan. Um, I myself being Persian, um, Arya is Thai, I believe, Greg, right? Yes. Arya is Thai. Yes. I'm Chinese. Yes. Um, so we were all pulling a lot from our own, uh, cultural backgrounds and sort of sharing that as well, um, for the sources of inspiration. Um, yeah. So you spend ages and ages researching and because you're an indie company and time and money is short, uh, you can never spend as much time researching as you want and you have to jump right into, uh, concept art and iteration, uh, to try and, um, discover what this world looks like. And a couple challenges arise from that. Um, I think the simplest um, avenue tends to be doing the characters because that's purely drawn. Um, That's all going to be whatever I design in concept, that's going to be the final product. Backgrounds tend to be more difficult. Um, I'm not necessarily a background artist by trade. Uh, but since I work in, uh, a lot of video game engines and before I was doing AR VR development, I was doing some indie game development, um, uh, previously on we are the caretakers, which I think is coming out soon. So check that out. Ooh. Um, <laughs> I was an intern though. So like, I was like, there, there was like a way hey. cooler artist on that, but you, you sounded <laughs> like you recognized Interns keep the it. world <laughs> go turning. So Um, so by, yes, previously by trade, um, and currently I work in a lot of game engines. So these backgrounds were built, um, primarily in Unreal Engine using something called kit bashing. So you download a variety of open source assets, um, and sort of edit them, whether that is changing the materials themselves, um, altering the meshes themselves. Um, maybe you'll take a screenshot of it and then you paint over it, which is what I would do. So I would sort of have these assets from a variety of packs and, 
uh, other open source websites, assembling them all in apartments and cities, um, swapping out all of the trees <laughs> for Southeast Asian trees, um, <laughs> and uh, then painting over that. So, but unfortunately, because a lot of it was kit bashed, it meant that the uh, language being used in this architecture was not um, as consistent as I guess the, the character art would be. Um, so just some little things of, of what that process can be like. Uh, but yeah, um, I guess technically that was the background uh, process. And for characters, it's just drawing on like Clip Studio Paint, uh, taking screenshots, testing it in uh, the engine that Greg coded everything in. Um, we're so proud of him for learning programming yeah, amazing. for this. <laughs> but you know what? Sarah did a fantastic job of of making everything in a consistent visual language. I You can't even tell. Sarah's like, oh my God, the architectural <laughs> language is not matching. But it yeah. like, totally matches. It. It's like so great. They're being way too hard on themselves. <laughs> right. They're being an Thank artist. You. Yeah. Thank you. You're picking it apart. We, we, we like dream about doing a a version like a, a golden version 2.0 mm. that we can we can add animations and particle effects and <laughs> sarah was like i would really love to do a graphic novel i was like let's get through this first <laughs> 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 oh my God. and so i wanted to come back to something you both were touching on, which is that the entire cast and crew of Dark City are Black and indi- Black or Indigenous people of color, save for your composer, I believe. Yes, um, save for my, our composer, but we love him. He's Jewish, though. He's, great. he's Jewish, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, as you both know, um, Black and Indigenous folks have had to deal with a very long and painful history of misrepresentation in games, on top of generations of cultural and historical erasure and oppression, at least in, speaking in the American context, which we are. Um, It's so powerful and necessary to have spaces where Black and Indigenous people of color are creating and preserving their own, our our own artifacts that are untouched by the white gaze and by colonialism. Um, I don't necessarily want to put words in your mouths, though, but like, what do you think of the capacity of games to kind of be tools for like reclaiming our history, pushing back on colonialist narratives, um, just kind of carving that space that is entirely separate from um, the the gaze of, of whiteness? That is such a great question, Spencer. And I think one of the things that made me so drawn to gaming and to theater, to be honest, to both of those particular mediums is the way both of them cultivate empathy that is Mm. different from the way, uh, like, say, film or TV or a novel cultivates empathy. And I think that returns back to the third tenet of theater, which I find so important, which is that it's laborious. It asks you to do the work right? The act of suspending your disbelief, the act of of critically observing why these parts work together in that way. Theater and games, that's where there's a huge intersection of that suspension of disbelief and of also of that critical mindset of approaching what you're seeing and how they all function together, right? Um, You know, I don't know that any artistic medium will be better than the other for reclaiming those spaces for you know trying to undo the the hurt and the pain that has been caused by uh, imperialism and colonialism and white supremacy but I do know that they can all of them all the artistic forms can be tools uh, of that for me games and theater are the best way to do it just for me, you know, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but they they have been by far the most effective and the most uh, impactful on me, at least. What about you, Sarah? Yeah, I think um, it, it is the same for me and for sort of two major reasons. Through visuals, um, when you read a book, you are going to envision everything that the book is describing in a way that's through your own lens. But in a video game, in theater, you are actually in a space where you are seeing someone else inhabit that role. So if you are someone who like reads a novel and imagines that every single person in that novel looks like you, maybe you're not actually seeing people of color. Um, Right. It was sort of a, I don't know. I guess I always remember people saying like, Oh, I imagined that they were a different race or my own is what they're saying and white for this. Um, so game sort of allow us. <laughs> Sorry. No, I just love um, you keyed in on it. It was great. <laughs> so games 
really allow us to not only provide a visual that is um, direct in, like what we were saying earlier about Dark City, those references to these cultures, um, but also through interaction, like Greg said, you're fostering empathy because you actually put someone in those shoes. And there are varying degrees of success in this. Um, mm. I mentioned earlier, I work in AR VR and I actually do this in academic context. And one of the reasons I moved to academia was because I was able to sit in conversations with students and that were guided by professors to have these, um, conversations in a curated, um, and guided context. Um, there are a couple of various projects that try and use VR to put, um, people of privilege, um, often white, into the shoes of people that are Black in America and to run them through scenarios there um, or to try and, you know, one project was um, uh, a VR clip um, or a VR segment, I guess, of a scene from Uncle Tom's Cabin where a woman was trying to run across the river. And you can actually have these discussions of, okay, is it really possible to teach someone a lived experience when you're really only giving them a taste. No, but you can start that conversation and you can give them a door for it, which is so incredibly important um, to do. Yeah. And games are just incredible at that. I think. Mm. Yeah. I just, I love this idea of um, like so often indigenous history and uh, like black history in America is overwritten. It's it's rewritten. It's recontextualized. It's uh, re-recorded by uh, like white people to framed in a way to make white supremacy acceptable or, or to oppress us or whatever, etc. I I love this just the fact that um, you know people of color creating games, putting them out there, and it's there. It can't be. <laughs> It can't be erased. It can't be taken away. Like it can't. Uh, it, like it's just, it's cool and important. I don't have better words for it. <laughs> um, there's a book called Aboriginal Narratives in Cyberspace by an Indigenous writer and filmmaker named Loretta Todd. And in that book, um, Loretta emphasizes how multi this concept of multi dimensional connectivity and communication have always been present in Indigenous worldviews. Um, I felt like that like really resonates when we talk about a piece of art like Dark City, which is literally creating a world full of uh, dynamic um, Black and Indigenous people of color and presenting it in a format that literally transcends space, time, location. Um, I'm wondering, like, do you relate to that at all? Um, and, like, why did it feel important to create Dark City in this way versus, like, I don't know, other forms of um, digital storytelling methods? Well, I can answer the second one straight away. <laughs> so the second one I can answer because that's what I could do. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, I mean, um, to to be completely honest with y'all, I am not a coder. I'm not a programmer. This is not. What? No. You know, like, it's just, okay. I mean, I guess I am now. Well, like, you are you know, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you you're are. right. I am. I am, bitch. You can't take that away from me. <laughs> you so, <did> it. <laughs> <laughs> prior, prior to this mo moment, I was I was not. I was not one of those things. Um, but I knew I could do it. And the reason why I knew I could do it was because of the work of queer and uh, some people of color, uh, women and trans gamers who did it before me. Uh, and they were a part of this collective that Anna Anthropy calls the DIY game movement. And Anna Anthropy is one of those uh, DIY gamers. Um, so back when I was in college, I read all of their literature, maybe not all of it, but like I read a lot of their <laughs> literature that they published about this. And there were two or three essays that really resonated with me. One was um, Moving Beyond Representation by Merrick Copus. And then another was... Um, 
Oh my god, I don't remember the name. It was several years ago. I'm so sorry, but but it, it was uh, it was a it was a, a writing by Anna Anthropy, and when I was seeing what they were writing about and how they talked about like how game making itself is actually a very exclusionary, you know, artistic practice. It's really really difficult to gain the skill sets to do it and to actually make games and make those experiences happen. You know, it's really hard. And what their work was, but was about like let's make DIY games and let's give people the tools and the skill sets to build it in really really easy and pragmatic ways and then let them come up with a way to queer the games and make them have queer mechanics and uh, you know like let let them explore what the game's structure needs to be for themselves so I read all these you know essays I was like I can fucking do this you know I can do this you know because it started off like with twine uh, and if you could learn how to twine then yeah. you knew how you could do like branching narratives and if you knew how to do branching narratives then you could probably teach yourself to do a little bit of the most basic code to that is most easily implemented with branching narratives, which was Python. Um, and then I learned to do oh, yeah, Python. Python, NBG. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went from Twine to Python. It's fine. You just learn Twine, then you learn Python. It's fine. I'm sorry. I, my partner is a, a full stack developer who also is doing oh, awesome. like stuff in Python to make games in, what is it, Aaron? Is it Unity? Yeah, so uh, but I can't I was use like, Unity. So is Unity dev? <laughs> I have no I idea just, how Unity works. <laughs> like going from Twine to Python, to, just as me as a non-developer, is like going from dr drawing on a piece of paper to like Adobe Illustrator, like Pro <laughs> mode. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to but say, I, like, but as I commend a developer <laughs> too, like, honey, I did it. You can do it too. <laughs> like, yeah. It was I just. Mean, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. Sorry, if, if I may, c coding really is just another form of language. That's why they call them programming languages. It's 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 the same sort mm. of process of trying to understand how to communicate intent with output. And Python actually is a great example of that because it writes like speech. Um, mm. Something like I, I learned through C++, which is a compiler language and is... I don't Sorry. fucking know what that's jargon, jargon and gibberish. <laughs> it's it's like a calculator. In the, it's it's like a calculator to programming languages where it's just if you if you like miss one period, it would be a semicolon here, but period. Um, everything is broken because it's going to do exactly what you told it to do. Uh, and you, you were wrong, <laughs> um, but Python is a little softer. Um, it's, it's a little smarter and, uh, it's a little easier to pick up for that reason because it lends itself to, um, a programming style that again is closer to human language. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. there, it's not as syntax, not as, um, shackled by syntax like other languages. So, I mean, this is all to say like these people, uh, Zoe Quinn, Anna Anthropy, Merritt Copus, they published their entire body of work. They documented it very extensively. I read through all of it and I was like, okay, I think I know how to, I can do this. I, I think, I think I know I can do this. <laughs> One of the great tools actually that Zoe Quinn had posted in uh, her resources was this platform called RenPy or RenP. I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, that's that's what Dark City is programmed in. Is this entire engine called Ren RenPy RenP, and they are amazing because they have this forum and this Discord server that like all these creators, as y'all just talked about, we're all crowdsourcing and like coming up with like solutions to like these complex questions together, right? And so I'm on this Discord like every freaking day, <laughs> and I'm just like, please tell me how do I do this? Like how do I do this? And people are always chiming in and like you know they're willing to teach and pass on their experience. So for me, like actually, you know, making Dark City has been a great joy of connecting across the world to relate back to your question. Uh, you know, it's been really, really uh, uh, great to connect uh, with uh, people from all across the world who are dealing with the same problems that I'm do dealing with. And why I made it in uh, Ren RenPy and made it a visual novel um, was because of the primary concern of accessibility, I wanted to be able to play it and pick it up intuitively. A lot of 4615 subscribers and patrons are old white people. I, if they're listening to this, I'm so sorry. I'm not trying to disparage anybody. <laughs> but like they are old white people and not a lot of them are like gamers, you know? And so for them to pick up like thing, it needs to be very simple, very easy just to click through. And that's what RenPy could provide. So that was a, like a big motivation of like, okay, I can do it this way. And also it's going to be easy for everybody else to pick up. Too. Now, to go back to your first question, which was about is is multi connectivity resonant in Dark City? 
I believe so. I believe it is because it's a game about uh, all of these relationships entangled with one another. There's actually a big metaphor about entangling in nature <laughs> to throughout it. So yes, I would say it is a core essential part of that. Um, particularly through the diaspora, uh, the lens of the diaspora people of color, right? You have two characters who are of the same ethnic group. This ethnic group is called the Edda. And uh, one is indigenous to the region and one is an immigrant to the region. They have completely different lived experiences. They have different dialects. And they comment about that throughout the game too. Um, They speak the same language, but they have different dialects. And they also have completely different worldviews about the role of the organization that they're investigating throughout this big mystery, this big conspiracy. So sometimes this connectivity is actually frayed because there are so many different strands that they're listening to all of these different uh, voices that it actually drowns out like what their major focus is. So that's, I think, you know, the kind of the core themes that we're trying to get at here. Uh, So yes, I would say it is very resonant. Would you, what would you say, Sarah? Yeah. um, I, I sort of have two thoughts following up on that. Um, For one thing, just your, your note, about um, the core of the game involves people who are all of part of the same ethnicity, but different um, uh, have different experiences with it. Um, I think it resonates with a little bit of what I heard you talking about in a previous episode. <laughs> so <gasps> to a little callback, um, but you mentioned how LGBTQIA people are all in a community, but you know, our individual letters, whether or not we are trans or a lesbian, um, all of our experiences are still different. And I think Mm -hmm. those nuances, um, go uh, apply the same way to people who have a multiracial experience in the way that we, um, both like a lot of the people on our team have experienced and also the way we try and depict it in the game, um, that you, you really have, you have this shared, um, identity between you, um, or a, an umbrella of that identity, but there are just these, there can be what feel like seemingly uncrossable differences at times. Um, but like with just like a, a little bit of time, you know, you can, you can find those, those ways and those little canals with each other or mm. like respect those differences, um, as something that are celebratory, but still separate. Um, mm. and it's just like this, like cool network of things that, you know, we're connected even if we're not the same. Um, and that difference is good. Right. Um, and can, can that adds diversity to our experience and can enrich really what we know and how we understand ourselves and others. Um, so that's sort of one aspect. The other, I think in terms of just like games, trans- transcending time and space and that connectivity element, um, I always viewed video games as a form of public art. Mm-hmm. Um, I began, uh, like my time in the art world through like a work program that's in Toledo, Ohio called the young artists at work. And the focus was to create um, murals across Toledo that were um, requested by its own community members. So Mm -hmm. something I'm really proud about that experience is um, you hear a lot about in Detroit, there's some really intense gentrification of people who are not actually a part of the city coming in, um, you know, doing these beautiful murals, but it's really not to the service of those who live there. It's to the service of people who want to increase the uh, property prices. Mm -hmm. Um, versus in Toledo, this is a movement coming from Toledoans in a Toledo space. Um, and Toledo itself is very, uh, sprawling. There's a lot of different pockets within it. Um, my, my, my usual attest or testament to that is we're like an ad test or not an ad test site. Um, we're a test site for like food places. If if that, if that, if that demonstrates it, like people are like, Oh, there are so many different cultural pockets in Toledo. We can test the Doritos Locos tacos like five years before it actually comes out. That sort of thing. <laughs> like I'm there's, there's Toledo. <laughs> <laughs> Toledo's great. I love Toledo. You will do better in Toledo. This is just a 419 ad. I have the um, same reaction, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, one of the reasons I got really excited about games outside of just having grown up with them was when I realized that things like MMOs or just the community ceremony of sitting down to a game together and the sp- brawling accessibility of games when you are trying to make them accessible, right? When you're putting an intent in behind that, they can become a form of public art. Uh, so something like uh, putting a game onto itch.io that could be downloaded for free, that 
is a piece of media now that if you're, uh, you know, with asterisks on uh, the the engine or the, the um, I don't know, like if you have to play it on a phone or whatever, I'm mm-hmm. blanking on the word, um, the method of play, right? The, like the tools you have to use. Or, the platform. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Spencer. Um, By the way, Dark City the is free play. to play. <laughs> Thank you. Episode one is free to play. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and downloadable on itch, I believe, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that can be widely accessible uh, in a way that, um, like Greg noted before, theater sometimes may not be. So we can sort of go back to this uh, site-specific medium that everyone can engage in no matter where they are so long as they have like a mobile phone or or a laptop and hey uh public libraries are still alive so you can play those at public libraries damn Mm. it (laughs) right Uh. i I also work in a library so it's or that's where the lab i work at is i'm very proud of them (laughs) libraries are the cornerstone of the anti-capitalist socialist dream of the future Mm. Louder. <laughs> that is right. That's right. Now, um, Dark City comes out in just a few days from the date we're taping this. This comes out on April 23rd, right? Yes. Um, amazing. How are y'all feeling? Like, how? Uh, what are you kind of hoping... If anything, like uh, like looking to the future, like what do you want folks to kind of take away from this experience of playing Dark City? Oh my gosh, <laughs> I haven't even thought about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I start because I have like a methodology about game design? That's, yes, of course. I think I'll, yeah. at least a little concise to buy you some time to think. Mm-hmm. Um, f- for me, making games is about is like another way of letting people sit at my dinner table. Um, Mm. there's sort of this element of being able to share what your experiences are with someone else. And in a, in a video game, it's like this empathetic, uh, empathetic glimpse right into someone's life and into the people that are making it like, and it shares that with theater. Like Greg said, it is laborious to the players, but also, sorry, it is laborious to the players, but I was saying players as in the actors, like the players in the oh, show. Yeah. But also the players as in the players who are audiences, yeah. players and players, uh, actors, audience, whatever. Mm. Um, look at that uh, intersection. But mm-hmm. yeah, there's there's something very intense about uh, the, the player in that context. So I, I, I think what resonates with me about Dark City is that nuance of the differences uh, in each of their experiences regarding their own ethnicity. Um, A lot of my friends growing up were biracial, um, but a lot of people weren't. And I definitely learned through my friends that were biracial, you know, we may all be 50-50 on something. um, And not to exclude multiracial people here, but I'm talking about my uh, personal experience. Um, Mm -hmm. But our experiences were vastly different. My dad came when he came to the U.S. when he was an adult, and he's very, very prideful about his culture. He has difficulty adjusting to certain things. Mm. Um, English is a second language. Um, but I have friends that are biracial that parents came over here when they were two and have lived in America their whole life. So they feel very disconnected from that culture and don't necessarily have an access point. And they may be less or more passing than, than one of our other biracial friends. So it's, there are so many nuances and how you experience it, even if you have this um, same thread. And I think Dark City is really, really uh, amazing at showing that because you have your lead characters being of this uh, ethnicity, the Edda, um, but they all have different experiences with it. And I want mm. I want a player to play that game who maybe their first thought in the the first 10 minutes of play are going to think, oh my gosh, it's just like all of the Edda and they're just going to be hanging out and it's just going to be the same, right? And realize, shit, there is so, so much more than just being one ethnicity uh, or one ethnicity not here is in not to confuse with like a, having a single ethnicity, but having this ethnicity, right? Mm-hmm. There's more. The, the experience of having it is so, so vastly different mm-hmm. uh, across people. I'm glad you 
mentioned that I think Sarah, I I like one, it it's always special for me to share space with other people who are biracial. Um and I think that it can be really difficult to find spaces to just talk about the experience of being biracial um, in a way that I think I'm speaking as someone who is 50% white and 50% Filipino. And I think that for me, the way that that, that uh, struggle manifests is I don't ever want my experience to be, you know, as someone who half of the time also passes as white and half of the time is clocked, it's like even people's experience of my race changes situation to situation. And so it can be so hard for me to stake my ground because so many people are very eager to label me, which again is another method of white supremacy to to assign and and box and put parameters around in order to be sorted and understood and and compartmentalized and oppressed and brought into the monolith of white supremacy like like so much of my existence has felt like a negotiation a negotiation with myself a negotiation with the spaces that i enter um even my relationships with other people of color and other white people are 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 constant sort of like shifting and and it's so hard to even put words to like the experience of just existing as a multiracial person. Um, so I'm always, I always get kind of em- emotional when I do have the opportunity because what you are speaking to um, can be difficult to just even find. Um, so it's a, it's really cool that this this piece of art is going out there. I'm excited for other like multiracial people to experience it, um, but also just thank you for verbalizing that um, because it, I think I'm still trying to find the language to like speak to what I go through in terms of sometimes feeling lost or feeling I'm like I'm not allowed to claim any of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, like it's just I, I think like and I don't mean to say that in a way where I'm complaining. I think being multiracial is a gift. I think that it uh, the, the experience uh, of like it my perspective is is constantly being challenged and broadened. Uh, I, I, I'm never, I, I think white people have the option to opt out of seeing their race, right? Like, like they, it doesn't have to ha- ever have to be a factor. And if they feel uncomfortable, they can kind of put it away, take it out of, uh, out of the equation of the conversation. And, and that's a way to distance themselves from having to talk about, you know, p- violence against people of color at, keeps them having to talk about their own biases, um, like the space they take up, the power they have and where it came from, like all of that becomes like no longer part of the conversation. And even though I am sometimes read as white, I have never been, I've never had that choice to opt out. Um, And I think that's been really important for me as a white person um, who's trying to dismantle my own internalized racism and and be anti-racist. Um, and as a person of color too, I think it's been valuable um, just because uh, I think I've always internalized the tenets of, of intersectionality, like the fact that all of our liberation is tied up in Black liberation. Like, you, like Black Lives Matter does not, it, like it is, it is a call and, and it is a reminder and it is not taking away from any of our other struggles. So like, I am thankful for the gift of being born biracial, um, but it's just so complicated. And so I- I'm just grateful for this space to kind of just scratch, barely scratch the surface of talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Spencer. And actually, you know, I- I've never uh, heard someone say, or at least I've never heard someone name it as a gift to be multiracial, but it, it totally, it totally, totally is. Speaking from my own experience, you know, I, I'm biracial, but I actually think of it as actually more than as, as three identities, really. I think of it as, you know, there is a white identity, there's a Chinese identity, and then there's also my biracial identity. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. those three identities, they at, when they triangulate and they work together, I feel like I can move through this world easily. 
and I, mm-hmm. that I, I can take up space and not feel bad about it. And I can, you know, communicate very forwardly and, uh, you know, relate my experiences and it's no problem. But when, <laughs> when there's dissonance, then it causes this huge, like, like cognitive, like meltdown in my mind. And I just like, oh my God, I have no idea how to approach this, you know? And mm. to this day, I've never really figured out a way to, um, I- I've never figured out a way how to like, you know, make them all work together consistently. And I don't think, I don't think I ever will. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I totally, you know, resonated with what you just said now was that our liberation is definitely tied up in black liberation. Totally, 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 totally. That's actually one of the moments, you know, that I think about now in this moment here, uh, calling back to a previous question, you know, why dark city, why right now in this moment, I have always approached my projects thinking about why do I, why am I doing this in this moment right now? And, you know, one thing I forgot to say earlier was that dark city is a story about holding power accountable Mm. and, it's it's about it's about a perspective of these two people who are from an oppressed uh, segment of society that are facing this gigantic monolith, this gi- huge organization, and going up against it. And that's what I feel like really strongly in this moment right now. I don't know if anyone of you know your users are aware of what's going on in the theater world, but right now we're grappling with historic white supremacy that has ingrained into our structures for five ever, you know, and it's really, really mm-hmm. terrible. And now that I've been reflecting on this a little bit, uh, particularly with Sarah's beautiful words just now. Can y'all see why I love Sarah so much? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, Sarah, you're great. <laughs> oh, you guys are cool. <laughs> um, so what I was reflecting on in this whole you know conversation that we were just having now, what I'm hoping people ultimately take away from this experience are a multitude of things. Um, first, that you must hold power accountable and it's big and it's scary to do so, but you have to speak out, you know, that's just the issue, right? Like is that it's too many times that we're waiting for coalition, but it really does begin at an individual grassroots basis. Another thing that I really want people to take away as well is um, what you just named Spencer was that our liberation is tied up in black liberation. It's in tied up in indigenous liberation, right? All of us or none of us. Um, mm. And then finally, and this is kind of not uh, related to race and equity, but maybe it is, maybe it is. But one thing that I want to take away too is to see video games as a valid form of programming for theaters to move forward with. Mm. You know, for us, this project was developed in, oh my God, Sarah, I don't know. How long have we been working on this? Since October. Since October, okay? So if we started in October on this, you know, and we're getting to the finish line right now, (laughs) right? The thing that I'm thinking about now is that, like, our theatrical experiences can totally, totally, totally be digitized. They can totally be in virtual. And what is theater if it's not the original virtual reality, right? Yeah. You know? theater is the original virtual reality. You have to suspend your disbelief. You have to like imagine like the world around and it combines the physicalization of course, but it is original virtual reality. That's not my quote, by the way, that came from a really genius guy named Dylan Arredondo. <laughs> and he's also a company member at 4615. And he said that to me, that also blew my mind. But those are the kind of things that I really want, you know, people to take away in this moment is that if we can hold power to account, if we can advocate for our black and brown and indigenous people, if we can start to imagine our method of delivery as something that's more equitable and accessible, we can all move forward together. You know, it's not that difficult. I mean, it is difficult, it's challenging, but it does take all of us. On this podcast, we typically invite folks to come in and 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 share with us a specific game or games um, that had some sort of impact on their life. And uh, the, the two of you shared two games: um, Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney, uh, which for the folks at home, you're a rookie defense attorney, a visual novel. Um, originally came out in 2001, but there's a whole trilogy. And then um, the second one was Tales of Symphonia, which is um, a classic JRPG uh, with like famously like deep emotional hooks um, and a really robust combat system that came out in 2003. Um, and yes. so <laughs> would you, where should we start? Should we start with Tales of Symphonia? Like, like what, what's the significance of this game to y'all? Sure. I, oh my God, Sarah, do you want, how do we even <laughs> begin this? Like this game is 
so much to me, it's, and it's like problematic how much it is to me. <laughs> I, I, I think I can start it because I was I was trying to sort of recap the game because it's been it's been almost ten years I think since I've played it. Mm. Um, so I was trying to like go back and research it and just like remember what was gripping me, and a lot of this was stuff that was so captivating to me as a kid that I couldn't put into words, and then what had sort of mm. pushed it to the forefront of my mind is I had seen a quote um, from it recently. And I was like, shit, you know, a game that's about like uh, a, a conflict that focuses on like half elven characters. It's kind of strange how that resonated so strong yeah. with me and my siblings as, you know, half Iranian <laughs> people during the Iraq war that started the same year it came out. Mm. <laughs> um, so uh, Tales of the whole conflict of that game began because this main antagonist's sister was killed during a war and her final wish was to see a world without discrimination. So mm. the whole core of this game's conflict is about the, the, the hatred that people were harboring, particularly in this fantasy world between human and elves. Um, so every single character in that game, most conversations, the major plot points, they all have some sort of interaction with this human and elven conflict, whether it's they are half elven or they are human, but were adopted, um, by a dwarf, but <laughs> it's still, they still, you know, whatever <laughs> there's nuances, um, yeah. Or characters that have elven blood in their veins, um, characters that were a part of this initial conflict, characters that are being discriminated against. It's so central in every single conversation. And it just really, really resonates. Um, or at least did when you were a little kid and no one had really sat down and talked to you about what it meant to be biracial. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess for me per, uh, personally, um, you had mentioned earlier, Spencer, like this, this idea of negotiation, um, and how it's like w- the way people perceive you and, and Greg, this, this dissonance that you feel, um, it's like the way people perceive you can just completely shift, um, how you see yourself, um, when you are biracial, because it's so much of it is built on what people think you are. Um, so like I, there was like one time a lady came up with me and she was like, what are you? And it was after a choir concert. And I was like, I'm an alto. (laughs) And then she was like, no, no, what are you? And I was like, I guess I sing soprano sometimes. (laughs) And then she was like the, no, what are, and I was like, oh, oh." (laughs) like I'm Iranian. (laughs) Um, I'm so glad I was muted because I just screamed. (laughs) (laughs) That and that sort of thing was so common, but Mm -hmm. especially back when I was a kid, um, and I was probably playing this when I was like, like ten ish. So it was probably a few years after the Iraq War started. So I was like, like, like like two, I guess two thousand like six ish or so. Mm. Um, I'm like a ten year old, and I have parents asking me like, if you're on in Iraq or the same thing. Oh or or just like making jokes of you know I couldn't rock so I ran um, just horrible things when you're when you're a kid you don't really understand but it seems normal or like kids running up to you and saying I tried to sell Girl Scout cookies at your house but a terrorist opened the door mm. that sort of thing all the time as this like people knowing you are something but then at the same time you have just as many people saying well you're not like like. Uh, my best friend growing up again was, was half Indian. They were like, well, you know, she's biracial, so she could talk about this. And I'm like, I am too. Uh, <laughs> so, so whether or not you're being uh, perceived um, and how yeah. that influences your identity. And so this game, you know, I'm this little kid who is experiencing this every day, but not really getting a conversation about it. Um, playing it with my siblings who are going through the same thing, albeit a little older. Um, and we're watching these characters uh, who are, also biracial, who are talking about the the desperate need to pass because of the discrimination that they are facing, um, and it just grips you because it's it's so. I keep saying resonant, but you you see yourself <laughs> in that character, and it's yeah. it's very rare to see that depicted. Yeah. Um, we're getting more diverse games now, but even even so, like like I think of like Dragon Age series, they have so many different countries and fantasy countries in the game. 
pretty sure not a single character, though, despite how great they handle cross-cultural interaction, is I don't mm-hmm. think there's a single character that's biracial. Um, and and being floating in those identities is is really I'm I'm trailing, but tells of Symphonia, you feel it. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, that, oh man, I want to go back and play it now. Um, Do all it. that hits. Um, Greg, what about you? Tales of Symphonia. I mean, you know, this is like, I think one, one of the big themes of our conversation here today is that we can share a similar identity, but have completely different experiences and approaches to it, right? You know, mm. Sarah and I are both biracial Asian people, but my experience with Tales of Symphonia is, a, I think, different than how Sarah was playing it and how, especially in that time period, how she was receiving it, right? For me, I had so much anti-Chinese hatred in my life all throughout high school, middle school. I I just had so much of it. You know, I harbored it a lot. I was so embarrassed of my mother and I was so like trying to hide my Asian-ness. And one of the things that I remember very clearly about Tales of Symphonia was when we discovered that Genus and Rain, who are two of the main characters in the game, when we discover that they're biracial, that they're half elves, it's supposed to be like this really like shocking discovery, and we're supposed to love Lloyd, you know, as uh, somebody who like accepts them no matter what, and you know, lives by his ideals, right? But for me, it was really, really difficult, you know, to like. It's not that I dislike them for being half elves. Like, that was never (laughs) a thing to me, right? But for me, it was really, really difficult to relate to that so quickly. And actually, Mm. Sarah last night shared a scene with me between Genus and Lloyd that I completely forgot about. But it happens in one of the, like, big denouements of the game where it's in the city of Flanor and like the depending on your affection level with each character you get like a very special scene with uh, Lloyd and the <laughs> other main character and in this scene it's Genus and Lloyd and Genus said something along the lines where I really hate humans you know I hate mm-hmm. how they treat me and I want to take Mythos' as si- Mythos is the antagonist I really want to take his side for a second here because I understand you know mm-hmm. and for me when I was playing that game in that moment, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like just making me think about this is really emotional. But like when I think about that moment for me, I was like, I think this is, you know, like all that ingrained racism and hatred where I was like, genius, what the fuck? You know, like that's Mm -hmm. the enemy. Like how could you like think of something along those lines, right? But I I had to like really think about myself and who I was in that moment and why I was harboring so much hatred, you know? I could blame it on the system, right? Like, you know, we live in a really white-centric, white supremacist society, and, you know, it, it's very anti-Chinese, you know, no matter how much we want to paint it any other way around, like, the United States fucking hates China. Like, that's just mm-hmm. the the fact of the matter. Um, so that that's a component of it. It could be, like, you know, more of a, like a, a, of a specific individual level where, you know, I grew up was very, very bullied uh, by, you know, white children making fun of Chineseness. So... For me, h- hopping over this whole thing and trying to understand Genus's perspective of like liking humans, in which this case human stands in for whiteness, and you know, uh, loving his half elven self, which is uh, standing in for loving his you know Asian self. For me, I just couldn't relate to it. I was just like, no, 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 no. I want to mm. suppress that. I want. I don't want to be seen as Asian. I want to be seen as white, and like. I've played Tales of Symphonia so many times. Like, I've played through that game so many fucking times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it wasn't really until I started growing up and, like, falling in love with who I was and falling in love with my language, falling in love with, like, my culture, that I was like, okay, you know, I think I understand where Genus is coming from <laughs> a little bit now. Yeah. You know, I think I really understand why he actually harbors this resentment and this hatred all of a sudden, because now like I'm seeing it from a perspective of like somebody who has like harbored, like, you know, just to imagine all of the grief that genus, the self hate that he had, that's like terrifying to do. And it's like, uh, (laughs) it's like so sad to see that there are people in the world that, you know, go through this, you know, I I think maybe that's another great part of like Tales of Symphonia and games in general is that, you know, through these playthroughs, you really cultivate this empathy for this character and really understand like where he's coming from. Um, You know, that's not to say 
Tales of Symphonia isn't problematic. Like, none of those characters are actually people <laughs> of color. They're all light skinned, like, mm. you, know, you know, white passing right. people. But that theme, that idea of self hatred was something that I was not able to clock until I was an adult. And this was a mm-hmm. game that was like teaching it to me when I was in 2002, like 2002, 2003, right? Like, it's a really old game. But mm-hmm. thank God for it. You know, thank God. Thank God for it. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Greg. And I I feel like it like when we talk about that feeling of self hatred, and of course, um, not to speak for your experience as a person of Chinese descent, but I think that when we speak about the Asian American experience, like the AAPI community, um, and that that kind of self hatred, um, like I think it's important to bring up the concept of the model minority myth and the ways in which it has turned Asian people against each other and, and in, in effort to make Asian people more aligned with white supremacy, like this idea that, you know, I I think a lot of Asian Americans in, in the diaspora, like really struggle with having honest conversations about our mental health, about allowing ourselves to like process emotions and to share them with each other. Um, I think this idea that Asian Americans are, you know, s- hardworking and smart and high achievers, it, it, it damages the capacity for us to allow ourselves to see ourselves and each other as like rich emotional people. And, and it's also just not true. Like, um, there's a research study out of the out of Pew Research Center that came out in 2018, and Asians are actually the most economically divided group in the U.S. Like, it's not all crazy rich Asians. It's not all like, you know. I hate that, that movie, by the way. <laughs> I, know, I just want to say, fuck that movie. <laughs> all the South and Southeast Asian people were like the servants and the help. Like it was like it was a very narrow depiction of like life for a certain subset of like people in a specific area. So like, again, Asian American culture is not monolithic. Um, and also like, I-, I think just what you're speaking to about that brand of um, concealing our Asianness and wanting to be white, um, like that's something as as kids that I, I think a lot of us can relate to. And um, like, <laughs> I- I'm-, I'm sorry, I'm getting <laughs> emotional too. I- I'm glad you brought it up. And and two, that I, I think it's something that um, I feel like we're, we're starting to really have a conversation about as a community of like, hey, this model minority myth isn't helping us. It is actually harming our community uh, and, it, and it limits uh, like what we're allowed to be and the space we're allowed to take up. Um, and, and two, like it's, it's not your fault that you wanted to pass as white and didn't want people to see your Asian-ness. Um, and and I'm glad that you're loving yourself so much more now. <laughs> well, it was a journey. <laughs> yeah. I want to add to, you know, especially in this movement, and we're seeing the rise in hate crimes against Asian American people. I just want to make sure that we're witnessing all of the Asian American hate crimes, and not even just Asian American hate crimes, but the Asian hate crimes that came before. The Iraq war, that's an Mm -hmm. Asian hate crime, Mm -hmm. you know? And that's the thing that I get so fucking, I just get so annoyed by this. And I'm not trying to call out anyone in particular, but a lot of my CJK Asian friends, CJK is Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Asian friends, they center themselves in this and they're talking about themselves in this, but we are blithely ignoring the past aggression, I'm sorry, not past aggression, the current aggression that the United States has towards Asian people, right? Mm -hmm. Afghanistan is an Asian country. Iran, Iraq, those are Asian countries, right? And I I get really, really (laughs) sick and tired of like this monolithic portrayal of, as you said, Spencer, of this uh, monolithic portrayal of of Asians as just the CJK folks, right? Like that's, that is not accurate at all. And it's really freaking grinds Mm -hmm. my ears. (laughs) And if I can like contribute to that thought, I like the fact that Iran is, is considered Asia or like is technically it is, is still very strange to me. Um, because Mm -hmm. that was something like, for one thing, I don't know if y'all, how many standardized tests you had to do growing Mm up, but like for most of my life, at least it would say, Hey, list your race, choose one. 
Uh, that old question. Fuck that question. <laughs> which, which is just, which I still saw like two weeks ago. Um, I, I remember I would have to have conversations with like our academic con- counselor when trying to apply for college. Cause I was like, I genuinely don't know what to put as my race. I genuinely mm-hmm. do not know because we're like Persians aren't what you think about when you're thinking of Asian people. Um, and what is that question even trying to ask? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's been push to get Middle East, North Africa as its own checkbox. Um, it's just very, the term, the Middle East wasn't really coined until the Iraq war as like the hate campaign from Bush. The, it, it, just the, the nature of the identity itself and what it is and what it's classified is, is already so transient mm-hmm. um, that it's, and even like, if you want to go into Iran, like whether the name, if you refer to yourself as an Iranian or a Persian, um, mm. cause Persia was far expanding past Iran, what it is now. And there's also a lot of really intense, um, cultural nuance within it of people who are like, I'm going to say I'm Persian, not Iranian. There's like stuff between like Iranians and Persians and Arabs. And there, it's just, it's just so there, there's so much within it yeah. with itself beyond just how it's being um classified by other people so so like hearing someone say that yeah the iraq war was an asian hate crime is so wild to me because i wouldn't have ever considered it that way i didn't know if i was asian and like Mm. i would try and look up on the like the u.s government website to be like what what do you count each country as (laughs) um and then i think they put but i think they put iran as like a white country for caucasian and it's like oh the caucasity jesus are you kidding Uh, (laughs) but then like the neck but when my cousins emigrated to the united states they were told to list themselves as asian so i had no idea It, it was it was changing every few years because it was whatever the government could kind of do to villainize us. Mm-hmm. Right. The, to- the concept of becoming white, how ethnic, like we start to decide like, okay, this group is now, we're not considering white people. It's, uh, it's just such a stark reminder of how, of like the construct of race and yeah. also how white supremacy uses it to also turn races against each other in ser- again, in service of white supremacy. Like it's just, uh, yeah. Anyway, and capitalism plays a big part. I don't want to. I don't want to mm-hmm. like be the guy who's like, "What capitalism?" Be <laughs> that guy. <laughs> and the big it, complexity yeah. that uh, capitalism drives this idea that whiteness is ideal and and like you know that's what we should all aspire mm-hmm. to. That has been so toxic. And me having grown up in Shanghai and having spent a year of my life in Bangkok, I saw firsthand about how like this economic, these economics behind these like aspirations to be white and lightening your skin and portraying yourself in this light, you know, so that you can appear lighter and lighter and lighter Mm. is so toxic and so pervasive. It's like, it's terrible, you know? And it's Mm -hmm. worth noting that there's, there's a clear difference between fairness and whiteness, right? Um, And I think I I see a lot of people exclude fair skinned Asian people in uh, social justice movements because they just like say like, well, that's white. It's like, no, (laughs) no. Um, And that's also, hey, uh, just as an art thing for any artists (laughs) listening to drawing different facial features is fun. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You should do it more if you don't. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I guess to pull back to, to, to Tales of Symphonia, um, I think my experience was very much just uh, that transience of not knowing where the place was. So or my place was, my home was, because the narrative around Genus and Rain um, is that uh, Rain was born to an elven women, woman um, who had, had uh, married like a human man. I forget what the context was, but their elven village essentially, uh, ostracized them. Mm -hmm. And, um, they, she became a, she had to like move to like the sky elven city or whatnot. And her name Um, was Virginia. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Virginia. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But they, 
Uh, but she sent Rain and Genus, um, who was a newborn, through this portal to another world. And Tales of Symphonia's story centers on these two worlds. Yeah, there's capitalism in it too. Uh, centers on this these two worlds that are constantly vying for magical power. And one world, Silverant, is essentially being constantly kept under the boot of Tefeala, um, mm. which has found ways through its technology. And because they have found ways of holding Silverant in the reclining, um, the, the waning arc of this like flow of magic, um, they've been able to keep it. Like their power just keeps growing and growing and growing. Their wealth just keeps growing mm. and growing and growing. And they use that wealth to keep Silverant in poverty. But Virginia, Regina and Rain's mother had thought, you know, in this other world, they couldn't possibly hate half elves the way we do. Mm. And, and, um, and not only are they trying to pose as elves in this human city that the story takes place, but as Greg mentioned, when they're ousted as half elves, they are immediately uh, exiled again. Um, and Genus back in the scene um, that Greg and I had sort of mentioned of, in the city of Flannery, Genus mentions um, in this line, and I have it open, uh, so I don't want to misrepresent it, is, um, I'm neither human nor elf. Neither side will accept me. Yet, unless I belong to one of them, neither will recognize my very existence. And so there's, like, what you were saying before about needing to negotiate your own identity, because it's like, to just have a voice or to have a place, you need to be something that people understand. Mm. Oh, my God. I need to play, go play this game. It's really Goodbye, good. everyone. <laughs> 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 it's great. Wow. It, I think it stands up pretty well. Like it's pretty good. Okay. So <laughs> let's talk, let's bring it back for a couple minutes to Ace Attorney. Um, this has been a, a far reaching conversation and um, I want to make sure that like everything out of y'all's mouth has been gold. So I, I want to take a little time to talk about Ace Attorney since that was another game that was really important to you. Um, so again, Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney, you are a rookie defense attorney um, going through, I believe the original game was like five different cases. Um, really iconic game that I think like like groundwork for people like to really thrust that visual novel into like the mainstream. Um, but yeah, let's talk about that. Like um, what's the significance of this game to you both? You know, it just like it proved to me that anything can be a game. <laughs> <laughs> anything that can be gamified you know i mean in terms of like dramaturgy like accuracy phoenix Wright is not a very good representation of the law or like you know what it means to be a lawyer <laughs> yeah. but like objection oh they say objection a lot <laughs> 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 a really great video like i think buzzfeed did it and there's like a defense lawyer like literally watching somebody play or she's playing through oh, no. phoenix right ace attorney she's like oh my god oh my god i cannot i can't <laughs> they bring out a metal detector to find a bullet in a guy's shoulder <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> for all of its cheesiness what I love about it, though, is it accomplishes so much with so little, you know? Listen, Dark City, by technology standards, by, you know, video game standards, there's nothing impressive about it. It's a visual novel, you know? You click, you go through, you argue with some people, and you investigate some scenes. It's just clicking, right? That's what Phoenix Wright was, essentially. And what I loved about Phoenix Wright was I was still having so much fucking fun, you know? Like, even though it was mm -hmm. so simple, like, I was like, yes, storyline. Yes, you know, like, uh, character arc. Yes, drama. <laughs> yes, mystery. Like, I love for it. I live for it. I die for it. I was like, this is so great. And it was, it, it, it was just something that I felt really great playing through. I think the newer Phoenix Wrights, you know, once they were able to add more than three lines of text in a paragraph, mm. like, that kind of, like, made it slow down a little bit. But in the mm. originals where they, you just had like two lines of text and they had to get all the information out as soon as possible. Like that shit was great because you were just sailing on right through. You were like, okay, I'm going to just pick this up and like figure out as I go along. And that's what I really, really loved about it because it was just great storytelling, really simple features, really great interactivity. And it was just easy, you know, simple and easy. And that's what I really liked about it. What about you, Sarah? Yeah, I think mine's kind of goofy because it goes back to this tie of video games in a theater because the reason it was so meaningful to me um, was because my sister and I actually streamed it on Twitch. And voiced um, the characters. And, and voiced the characters. <laughs> <laughs> oh my 
time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, and I think I had mentioned this when we were first sort of trying to hash out what we wanted to talk about, but co-ops and game is so valuable to me. It's just like the third child, you know, mm. I, I never got to actually hold the controller. I was sitting next to someone reading the strategy guide. <laughs> but it's also so funny. <laughs> It's an important role. It's a yes. critical. It's, uh, yeah. Yes, Chalice Bear in Crystal Chronicles, all that jazz. <laughs> Shout out to my sister. <laughs> she was great. Um, but like Tales of Symphonia was co op. Phoenix, right? It's not co op, but you can make it co op if you are theater nerds. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were performing this uh, for like a modest audience. I think at most we could get like 20 people um, on a solid stream. For Twitch. But yeah. yeah, like it was cool. Um, and I don't know. It's it it, it it blurs that line because when we were making Dark City, the, the language that we were using, me as um, a video game developer who grew up doing theater and Greg as a thespian and a director and a writer, the game script is just a script, right? The assets that I was making were props. The backgrounds were sets. Everything translated almost directly one-to-one. Particle effects, SFX. The words themselves don't even need, need changes there that's just what it is for both mediums so having to like getting to play phoenix right as if the game was a script for me and my sister doing ridiculous goofy voices (laughs) um was just incredible and you know that would be the dream for dark city for me would for me would what the dream for dark city would be for me is to get something that's like fully voiced to really have those actors that are so fantastic Mm. the vas in the game are just so freaking cool like to do that live reading or to be able to voice that entire game because it just adds so much freaking life um but yeah phoenix Wright was was that so if you're rich, me, it was another collaborative. Yeah, please, yeah, yeah. Um, anybody who really likes Dark City, <laughs> who maybe he's Hell listening, yeah. donate. To us. donate. <laughs> Our voice actors are amazing. They're so They're good. They're so good. So yeah, let's let's. Um, it's first. It's been incredible to have you both. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Um, I'm sad to let you go, but before you do, um, where can folks find Dark City and and follow you? Where can they follow uh, for Six One Five Theater Company, and, and where can they catch up with the two of you if you have any any public profiles? Um, so to learn more about uh, Four Six One Five, you can go to our website Four Six One Five Theater dot com and that's theater with an re because we're an art form <laughs> and then oh, <laughs> the uh itch io page that we're hosting dark city on is 4615 theater co co dot itch dot io um and like we said episode one free to play it drops april 23rd please play spread the word you know we're so new to this world we don't know like what who's who are video game <laughs> journalists we don't we don't know Right. <laughs> um, so yes, please spread the word. And then for me, I am all up on Instagram all the time. Slide into my DMs. I love it. It's at Gregory dot Kung K E N G dot Strasser S T R A S S E R. Beautiful. And Sarah. Yeah. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm more active on there than Instagram at uh, underscore S E S K A N D A. Saskanda. Um, and that's, I just post a lot of like dumb fan art and occasional project updates um, for things like Dark City, or currently I'm on a um, kickstarted game called Chess Heroes. Um, so just like a. And it's sick. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, seriously, I want to play all the games that you've worked on, Sarah, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Um, thanks. And Gregory, I am a fan of 4615 theater. I love talking to theater makers because about games, just because I feel like um, we see all the the ways that they are like mirrors of each other. And Mm -hmm. I just love, I love talking to people who make theater about games. But anyway, Greg and Sarah, thank you so much for joining us on Pixel Therapy. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Y'all are great. You guys are great. is up for today's session of pixel therapy thank you for tuning in and we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own if you want more pixel therapy come check us out at patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod where you can snag that monthly bonus episode for just two dollars a month plus opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly 
you're not up for contributing monetarily, but you enjoyed this episode, you can show your support for free by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and following us on Instagram at Pixel Therapy Pod. That stuff is just as important, and we do appreciate it just as much. Remember that Pixel Therapy is a happy member of the But Why Though Podcast Network, so you can support us by supporting them and heading over to butwhythopodcast.com. That's though with a T-H-O. Take a peek at the inclusive geek community they are building around pop culture news, reviews, and kick-ass podcasts like yours truly. And you can keep up with all of this stuff and more by visiting our website at pixeltherapypod.com. Finally, since we like to put our money and our energy where our mouth is, we end every episode with a recommended side quest. Thank you so much to Sarah for this week's recommendation. Your side quest is the Arts Commission of Greater Toledo's Young Artists at Work program. A little bit more about that. Since 1994, the Young Artists at Work has offered paid summer apprenticeships to area teens to learn creative skills and job skills alike and to connect to community through the creation of public art and saleable works. Each year, more than 40 teens from diverse neighborhoods and communities in and around Toledo come together to find a completely unique summer employment opportunity and access to an experience designed to impact for a lifetime. Basically, um, they hire um, groups of teenagers for the summer to kind of be in community with each other and make art that starts conversations um, um, both internally and in their local communities. It's really cool. And I think just important to show that creative fields, you know, you can make a living as a creative person and, and arts <laughs> are just as important as other other forms of employment. I don't know. I just, I like that. Um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's important. Uh, the Arts Commission continues, Toledo's teens need access to arts and creative opportunity now more than ever. For more than 30 years, our programs have inspired thousands of Toledo youth to explore their individuality while working as a team to change their city for the better and to develop more fully into thoughtful and responsible citizens. Our YAAW and congressional alumni can be found all over Toledo and the world making a difference. So you can learn more and donate at theartscommission.org slash support. Awesome. Thank you for that side quest, Spencer uh, and Sarah. That is our show for today. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC every now and then. We'll be back soon with some more Pixel, Pixel Therapy. therapy. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>